uh, Leader Laos. Speaker, I beg to move that the proceedings on the business set down on order paper for today be exempted at this stage sitting from the provisions of standing order number two. Uh, the question is the motion moved by the Leader of the House. As many as are of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Mr. Christopher de Souza. Sir, Singapore must be bold in making legal moves in light of global trends which have disadvantaged the citizenry, public institutions and governments via a deluge of falsehoods. It is easy to wave a banner, whip up emotion and say freedom of speech at all costs, but much harder to sit down, study the subject and put in place measures to ensure that freedom of speech does flourish without the destructive nature of falsehoods. In essence, the proliferation of online falsehoods undermines freedom of speech. It does not promote it. Why? Because no discerning member here could disagree with the following contention, that falsehoods, cyberbullying, trolling and hate speech corrode rather than promote public debate. They damage society's shared public space and reality. If non-reality is allowed to become reality, this harms society as decision-making is prejudiced by falsity. Falsehoods can unfairly inflame passions to prevent rational debate. Falsehoods, especially when amplified by bots and trolls, can intimidate other voices, thereby preventing people from being exposed to a diversity of views. They devalue and de delegitimize the voices of experts and authoritative institutions thus undermining society's ability to engage in rational discourse based on shared facts. These can have major ramifications. The Brexit referendum is a classic example of how falsehoods can penetrate and prejudice even mature democracies. We must learn from that and prevent falsehoods from penetrating the precious crucible of public debate in Singapore. Indeed, what some of the things that were, saying, were being said in Brexit could have led Michael Gove's exasperated comment during the height of the Brexit referendum campaigning where he said, people in this country have had enough of experts. Falsehoods can undermine the concept of an objective truth. This may have the negative effect of causing citizens to disengage from public discourse altogether. In the Czech Republic, a survey showed that 53% of Czechs believed that there was both pro-Russian and anti-Russian propaganda in the Czech public space, and they could not trust anything. My next point is legislation cannot be viewed as the antithesis of freedom of speech. To the contrary, legislation is needed to protect freedom of speech. Why? Because leaving corrections to somehow organically or innately work themselves out is simply ineffective. As a result, truth suffers. Some examples would help. In October 2014, nationalreport.net, a fake news website, published a story that street artist Banksy had been arrested in London and that the City of London Police had identified Banksy as Paul William Horner, a 36-year-old male born in Liverpool, England. This article received a total of 60,000 shares on Twitter and Facebook. By contrast, it took nine debunking articles by major news outlets such as The Independent, The Huffington Post, etc. to reach the same total of 60,000 shares. The point I'm making is that to rely on existing rem legal remedies would be far too insufficient to deal with the threat at hand. As Dean of SMU Law, Go Yi Han, stated, existing laws are limited in terms of speed, scope, and adaptability. Simply put, while criminal penalties may apply to punish perpetrators, there are no legislative levers to ensure the timely correction or removal of fake news. You know, many people have expressed concern that the bill will create a chilling effect on public discussions. That is far too broad a criticism. 
The corrections regime encourages free speech by ensuring that people are exposed to more viewpoints and more facts, not less. This is in line with the marketplace ideas theory, marketplace of ideas theory. In line with this, we need good public debate. Therefore, I'd like to ask what the government's plans are to ensure well-meaning members of society that they should continue to contribute to meaningful civic discussions. Now, Mr. Singh questions why the executive needs to be part of a solution. He says that the courts should be part of the solution in the first instance. Now, do we need an appropriate decision-making body? Yes, but the type of decision-making model is key. Why? And for the record, I disagree with Mr. Singh, and I do not think that the courts are the best place to, he to hear this in the first instance and decide whether a takedown notice needs to be made or a correction uh, direction needs to be made. Why do I say that the type of decision-making model is key? Because we should be completely aware of the nature of the threat which lies before us. It is dynamic, it evolves swiftly, falsehood, falsehoods can spread like fire in hay. They need to be curbed and responded to robustly before they can cause harm. Falsehoods can threaten public safety and create riots. So against the nature of the beast, what factors ought to shape the model, the model of the decision making in the first instance? The need for speed, a nimble response. That is clear. In these situations, there's no luxury of time to make decisions, you know, going through the court process, etc. In the words of the Select Committee Recommendation 12, I quote, the measures will need to achieve the objective of breaking virality by being effective in a matter of hours, hours. And that could be after court hours. A riot can break after the courts close. The decision maker also needs to be equipped with the information to make the decision speedily. The decision maker must also be the right person to weigh in on issues of public interest. Now, it's a dynamic situation, right? Let's say that there is a riot, and during the course of the riot, there is the statement that the police killed the person because of the person's race. Now, that needs an immediate intervention by the executive in the form of a minister to say, that's incorrect. He has to decide whether or not it should be taken down or put up a correction direction in the form of what is the truth. You want to refer to the courts for that? Half an hour later into the riot, it says that police are opening fire on innocent people. That's false. The minister, again, having to deal with the consequences, must look and say, what correction must go out? Does it need to be taken down? Does another piece of information need to go up? To put that in perspective, to balance it. Refer to the courts again? Surely not. Half an hour later, oh, another allegation out of the blue. The police are trying to uh, disarm the CCTVs to get rid of the evidence. That's false. Again, the minister at the time, well after court hours, maybe, would have to make a decision, what do I do? Take that down? Issue a correction detect, uh, direction? Surely, the minister being the executive has the play of all the facts. He's in the mix. He's got the officers reporting to him. He has to make decisions at, you know, very quickly, life and death. So this may not only just be about falsehoods per se, but the consequence of what those falsehoods would lead to. Refer to the courts. Mr. Singh says philosophically he has a disagreement. Philosophically it shouldn't be the courts. But I ask Mr. Singh to look through and decide practically what do Singaporeans need in times of crisis. And after all, after all, in the first instance when the executive makes the decision, that is reviewable. It is reviewable 
through two mechanisms and not one. The first is a statutory appeal mechanism and the second is judicial review. So the minister's decision is reviewable. So I don't think we should be uh, debating on philosophy and getting tongue-tied over uh, illusions of philosophy. What happens if there's an endemic that is breaking out in a hospital? Where every minute matters. Refer to the courts. I have great respect for the courts. And I think as a tier above the minister, a tier of review, I should rephrase, a tier of review, they are best placed to decide whether that order was correct or not to begin with. But not to put the courts in a mix where it is such a dynamic situation. Now, uh, Ms. Irene Kwe has also discussed this issue of uh, another body. I think uh, I've read the order, the supplementary order paper, and I think it is called an a independent council uh, that looks into uh, the issue of falsehoods. Well, I, I don't agree that there is a need for that council. Um, if one looks at the order paper, one of the functions of the order paper seems to want to replace the, uh, one of the functions of the council seems to want to replace the ministerial decision making and also determine what is fact. So it seems to want to do two things, both the executive role as well as the judicial role, when actually there is every time we sit an ability to hold the minister to account in this decision making process. So I think we have to be very clear about the the nature of the beast that we are dealing with. I don't think we should be blind to the fact that there are major issues around the world and that falsehoods can tear a multiracial and a multi-religious society like Singapore can tear it quite quickly and quite swiftly and we must guard against that. And therefore for principal reasons and for practical reasons I am in support of the model of allowing the executive to make the first instance decision and then have it reviewed by the courts. And we've heard the minister state that in subsidiary legislation, this is going to be an accelerated process. Actually, within nine days, you could get a hearing if indeed the complainant uses his right quickly uh, within the 14 days that he has. So for these reasons, that I don't think we should be waving a banner of freedom of speech without understanding the consequences of what that entails in dynamic situations when falsehoods can catch like fire and hay. And for those reasons, I support the bill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I'd just like to uh, clarify a point uh, made by uh, the Honourable Member, Mr. Christopher de Souza. Uh, this, I'm quoting from a, the executive summary of the report of the Select Committee on Deliberate Online Falsehoods, and I want to deal with the point he made about riots and having to wait for a court order. But I want to suggest to him that sometimes executive action in itself can be problematic, and I'm going to quote from this example. Paragraph 24, page 5, falsehoods that undermine trust in public institutions can impede constructive policy making and the ability to respond to crisis and threats effectively. For example, when German police debunked a false claim that immigrants had raped a girl, they were falsely accused of covering up crimes con committed by immigrants. This contributed to street protests. So I can understand the members uh, view that urgent action is important, but executive action in itself may not always be uh, the solution that will solve the problem. And I think it's important to understand that there could be other solutions that may inevitably work to uh, be persuaded, that the members of the public could be persuaded by other forms of actions like a court, like a court order. 
Mr. Christopher de Souza. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I would invite uh, Mr. Singh to actually look at the report. Principally, I will quote four sections of the report where it says specifically that swift action is key. Swift action is key. The importance of stemming the spread of online falsehoods, para 357, subpara A. Specific objectives provide swift access to the facts, para 361 of the report. And in page 103 of the report, part C, neutralize false amplifiers swiftly. I think this brings to bear why in recommendation number 12 at page 133, we want to be able to discredit falsehoods swiftly. Now, in all of these instances, I would humbly suggest to the House, humbly, that our executive, our ministers, the office bearers, who are fed with information on what is happening on the ground, can make the best decisions within the limited time that they have. And if there's any delay, Goodness knows what the consequences could be, and that would harm Singaporeans. Ms. Irene Kuei, you want to make a clarification? Yeah, I would like to make a correction that when I meant independent counsel, I'm not referring to a counsel that will make executive decision. So what we are proposing is a post-review counsel uh, to, uh, for learning purposes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yep. Yes, sir. Uh, I thank uh, Ms. Quay for that. I've studied the order paper supplement and actually under the functions of the council, under H at page 7, it says, to perform such functions as the minister may by order publish, assign provided such functions do not compromise the independence of the panel. It would seem to me that this council suggested through this suggested amendment envisions, uh, envisions practicing some of the ministerial functions. And in addition to that, at F, at page 7, under functions of the council, it says, to liaise with scientific specialists and technical experts to advise the government on examining contested facts of a specialist nature. And it seems that the council that uh, this amendment envisions is taking on the, uh, the, the adjudication role of what is fact and what is not. So I do think that there, we should be, take it seriously, the amendment, look at it for what it is, and in my considered view, the executive plus an oversight of the, the, the judiciary is the best way forward. Okay. Uh, Irene? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, we, are, we are not suggesting that the oversight committee take over this executive decision. So we still maintain that um, for ministers to make the executive decision. So our stand of uh, independent oversight council is for review of the past cases for, to fine-tune future uh, bills. That's all. Yeah. Indeed, I, I thank Ms. Quay for that clarification. Hitherto, I don't think the wording in the order paper supplement uh, suggested that explanation, but if it's a clarification, then it does put some perspective. Thank you.